a cold case, the brutal murder of a 20-year-old college student that remained unsolved for 20 years, was finally brought to justice when her best friend had a vision. This vision prompted her to get back in touch with the police department who had previously been handling the case. She managed to get the interest in the case reignited and the new investigating team used modern day forensics to analyse that DNA materials that were found all those years ago. The only reason this case was ever solved was because of this woman's determination to find out what had happened and to get justice for her friend. This is Red Rum, stories about the true victims of crime. I use news archives, documentary footage and books to research these cases, and so the episodes are accurate to the source materials I can find. You can find all episodes in podcast or YouTube form in the description box down below. You can get ad-free releases on Patreon, where you can support Red Rum to keep happening from just a couple of quid a month. Thank you. Angela Marie Samota, who we're going to call Angie in this episode because that's what her family and friends called her. She was born in 1964 in California. She and her friend Anita Kadala had gone to this late lunch together one day with their professor. And this was on the 12th of October, 1984. They had gone to this late lunch and they enjoyed it. And then once it had finished, very uneventful, they headed back to Angie's apartment. Once they arrived, they continued chatting probably simply talking about the events of the day, what had happened, what they talked about with their professor, and soon enough, they had both fallen asleep on the sofa. They planned to go out that evening and planned to be out till quite late, so a nap was probably needed. Now, when Angie and Anna woke up, Angie grabbed some clothes out of her closet and she settled on this black jumpsuit and some black pumps for the evening. And then there was a knock at the door. Angie opened it to find her and Anna's mutual friend, Russell Buchanan, waiting on the other side. She invited Russell in and the three of them continued chatting with the women continuing to get ready. And then they decided to head out. But before they were going to do that, they were going to go over to Russell's apartment so he could get ready for their evening out. Now, when he turned up at Angie's house, he had actually been ready to go out, but when he'd seen what Anna and Angie were wearing, he decided he felt a little bit underdressed. And so he asked if they could just hang at his apartment just for a little while that evening so that he could get ready and then they could all go on and enjoy their night. Once they were ready, they made their way to Bennigan's restaurant for dinner before heading out to the state fair. They played a few arcade games and went on a few of the rides before picking up some more food and then heading to the Rio rooms for some drinks, some hanging out and some dancing. Time went quickly and before they knew it, it was 1am. Now, neither of the three of them had been drinking very heavily because the bar was so busy for one thing. And so when 1am rolled around, they were pretty happy to be going home. They also knew that they should probably head home relatively soon because they were all busy in the morning. Angie herself would be heading to a college football game the next morning. And on top of that, she'd been designated driver. So they all got into Angie's car. She headed to drop her two friends off. And then instead of heading back to her place, she continued the journey onto her boyfriend, Ben McCall's house. Ben had been invited out that night, but he decided not to go because he had work early the following morning but Angie couldn't help it. She really wanted to see him. And so she decided to just pop by, just do a quick good night, have a kiss, have a cuddle, and then head back to her apartment. And that's exactly what she did. Now, Ben hadn't expected to hear from Angie again once she left his apartment, but at 1.45 a.m. that same morning, his phone rang. Angie was on the other end of the line and she wasn't in a good way. She was confused and she was panicking. She said that a man had approached her apartment door, knocked on and asked to use the phone and her bathroom. He was currently in the bathroom right now. Now on top of this, Ben knew that Angie's roommate Sheila was out of town. She was staying with her mother. And so he knew that she was gonna be all alone with this unknown man and that just didn't sit right with him. Ben tried to get a little bit more information out of Angie, but before she could answer any of his questions, she said that she had to go and she would call him right back. And then she abruptly hung up. This was extremely concerning for Ben. There was no way he was just gonna sit there and wait. And so he picked up the phone and tried to call Angie right back, but the phone just rang out, no one answered. 
He tried again, and he tried again, and once more. Now, every time, there was no answer. Suffice it to say, it wasn't long before Ben decided to get into his car and go round to Andy's place. He needed to know for himself that Angie was okay. And so he raced across to Angie's apartment, which wasn't far away. And when he got there, he tried to open the door, but it was locked. And he kept knocking on, hoping that someone would answer, but no one came to the door. And so that's when he left the apartment, he got back into his car and he considered what he should do. He had a thought. He wondered if the back door might be open. So he got back out of his car, walked around the side of the apartment to the back door and tried that one, but that one was locked as well. Now, thankfully, although this is back in the early 1980s and most people don't have a mobile or a cell phone, he did have one because he worked as a construction worker and his work had provided him with one. So he went back into his car and he managed to use his phone to call. But again, there was just this ringing tone sound and it just rang out and he didn't answer. Now, Ben did a little more investigating, hoping that perhaps Angie's car wasn't there. Perhaps she'd driven off somewhere and just absent-mindedly forgotten to call him back. Of course, this seemed unlikely. Angie was incredibly thoughtful. She probably wouldn't have done this, but he just didn't know what else could have happened. And that is when he found Angie's car in her regular car parking spot. And at this point, he could not ignore that kind of worried feeling he had anymore. He knew something was wrong and so he called police at 2.17am. So from the time Angie had called him to the time that he had got to the apartment and called the police at 2.17am, it had been just over half an hour, so not very long at all. The police arrived quickly and they were concerned enough, Ben told them what had happened and that he could no longer get in touch with Angie. And so the police immediately spoke to the condo manager and they explained what was going on and they managed to get a key off of him. They gained entry into the apartment and they found Angie's body. She was dead, she was lying on her bed naked and she was covered in blood. She had been stabbed a total of 18 times. Her legs were hanging off the end of the bed and when they looked further, they found that there was blood residue in the bathroom as well. On further forensic examination, they found that she had likely been raped and so they took a DNA sample from the semen that was found. Ben was devastated. He'd had a bad feeling, hence why he decided pretty much straight away to go to Angie's place, but of course, he'd never expected this. He gave police a full statement about the last time he'd seen Angie and also what he'd been doing throughout that night. And on top of that, he agreed to give them uh, his DNA, including hair samples for forensic investigators. He said that they could search his truck. He had nothing to hide. He just wanted them to find the person who had done this to his girlfriend. But when police asked him if he would take a lie detector test, a polygraph, he said that no, he didn't want to. Now, I couldn't find the reasoning he gave for not wanting to do this, but we know that polygraph tests are unreliable and there could be a number of reasons for not wanting to submit to a lie detector test. And so although no official reason is listed, we just know that he didn't give them a polygraph test. Ben's DNA samples came back as a non-match to the DNA taken from the crime scene. And back in the 1980s, DNA was, of course, nowhere near as sophisticated as it is today. But the forensic investigators could tell that the person who had done this was a non-secretor and Ben was a secretor, much like 80% of the world's population. And so it became quickly clear that Ben had nothing to do with his girlfriend's murder. The autopsy soon came back and it confirmed that Angie had been stabbed 18 times and one of these wounds, the deepest wounds, was four to seven inches deep and it had gone straight through her heart. It also appeared from blood spatter that during the attack someone or something had covered Angie's mouth and those amount of stab wounds were indicative of this attack being deeply personal. This was overkill. Although one of the officers at the time said that this amount of stab wounds could, however, have been less so that the attack was personal, was an act of revenge or some kind of hate, but more so that when Angie's boyfriend Ben had arrived at the apartment, perhaps she wasn't dead yet. Perhaps she tried to call out and try and make herself known. And so then the attacker had stabbed her to render her completely unable to speak and move. 
A blood spatter analysis found that there were also voids in the pattern that were consistent with someone being on top of Angie at the time of the attack. They also found that there was blood in the bathtub and in the sink, indicating that the killer had taken some time to actually clean up after the murder. Police officers questioned Russell Buchanan, one of the friends that Angie had met on the night of her murder, and they found out that he had met her back in 1984 in October through his roommate's girlfriend. He had last seen Angie when she dropped him off at his place, and he actually hadn't learnt of Angie's murder until the police informed him a few days later, because straight after that evening out, he'd gone to sleep, and when he'd woken up in the morning, he had gone to a wedding in Dallas before flying home for the weekend. He'd flown home to Houston, and this is 1984, so... They didn't have the kind of communication we have now in terms of cell phones, social media, things like that. So he only found out when he arrived back at home and the police knocked on his door. The fact Russell left town soon after Andy's murder definitely caused police to hone in on him as a potential suspect. And when they did eventually question him, they noted that he seemed kind of awkward, he was shy, and he clearly had some kind of a crush on Angie. And again, this to them was a red flag. He hadn't mentioned this, but it came out in the interview. The investigating team soon got Russell to agree to having his DNA taken, including blood samples and saliva samples. And they came back as showing that Russell was a non-secretor. This matched just 20% of the world's population and, of course, matched the killer. Now, obviously, this isn't going to be classed as any kind of solid evidence against Russell. It's just too generalised. But it certainly pointed to looking at Russell in a more uh, sort of specific light from the investigator's point of view. Meanwhile, Angie's roommate Sheila was really struggling to come to terms with Angie's death. The fact that she hadn't been home that night was really weighing on her mind. I mean, of course, if she was home, she might have met the same brutal end that her friend had met. But on the other hand, she was thinking that if she had been home, maybe that would have been one too many people. And maybe the killer would have had no choice but to leave them both alive. Because of this thought, Sheila simply struggled to continue on with her studies and she ended up dropping out of college. From that point on, she made it her mission to try and help the police narrow down and find Angie's killer. And her focus at first was on Russell Buchanan. She knew Russell through Angie and she'd always had a kind of strange feeling about him. And so one day she invited him out for lunch, determined to sort of lure him into a conversation about Angie, hoping that he'd eventually open up and slip up and she'd catch him in some kind of a lie. The pair spoke a lot, with Russell actually revealing to Angie that he'd stopped cooperating with the investigation. After he'd done a lie detector test and it came back as he was telling the truth about having not murdered Angie, but that he was being deceptive in other areas... After that happened, Russell decided to lawyer up. Other than that though, Sheila didn't find anything out that might have been useful in terms of Russell's involvement in the crime. And throughout her conversation with Russell, although she did find him a little bit odd, she still wasn't sure that he was the killer, certainly not after their conversation. There just wasn't enough evidence to point to him. The case went cold with no real evidence that could lead to Russell's arrest and with no other suspects worth pursuing, the police weren't actually able to really investigate Angie's murder any further. The case went cold for the next 20 years, with Sheila constantly calling investigators to just try and get more information from them and also giving them bits of information that she thought might be useful to them. But nothing really happened until Sheila had a bit of a spiritual moment. By this point, Sheila had moved to Tennessee and she was living with a family of her own. She had two sons. And while she was there, she was doing some Bible study homework and she was there really concentrating hard. And she speaks of the fact that she has dyslexia and she found it quite hard to look at the really tiny writing. And so her eyes would go a bit funny. And then she looked up and she had this vision. Angie appeared in front of her clear as day, and although she didn't say anything, the message was clear. She needed to open up this unsolved murder once again. 
And when Angie came to, she started doing a bit of research into the area that Angie had been murdered in. Now, this is 20 years later. We have much more uh, access to the internet and it's much easier to look things like that up. She found a number of newspaper and police reports of rapes that had happened around the same time in that area back in 1984. Now, she reported all of these potential leads to the Dallas Police Department. She ended up calling through to that police department over 700 times. In fact, she left messages for this one particular detective who she'd been in contact with over 20 years ago and who she'd been working with quite closely in terms of giving them all of that information she knew about Angie when they were questioning her way back in 1984. That same detective and Sheila had always had this kind of really good professional relationship. Back in the 1980s, they'd speak so often and got to know each other so well. She even invited him to her wedding and he came. The fact that now he was not returning her calls made Sheila feel a little bit bitter. She didn't really know what to do. With all of this research and amateur investigating going around in her head and becoming her new sort of daily life, she made a decision. If she was going to get to the bottom of what had happened to Angie, then she needed to do this properly. So in 2004, she decided to retrain and she actually started uh, training and then working as a private investigator. And although this seems to have taken a very, very long time, the police department did actually get back to her and it was when a new detective had taken over the case. This detective called Sheila and wanted to speak to her. They wanted to gather as much information from her as possible and they told her they were going to re-examine the case. In 2008, that detective tasked with reopening Angie's case put through the old DNA samples that came from the crime scene they put them through these new technologies. The DNA included some materials collected from underneath Angie's fingernails. She clearly tried to fight back. She had scratched her attacker in an attempt to defend herself. They also had the semen samples and blood samples from the crime scene. And with this new DNA technology that was available, it wasn't long before there was a match. And that came back to someone who was already in the police system, a man called Donald Bess. Donald was already in prison. He was serving a life sentence for aggravated rape, kidnapping and sexual assault. At the time of Angie's murder, Donald had literally just got out of prison on parole. He'd been serving a 25-year sentence and once he was paroled, he'd been out near Angie's apartment when he'd spotted her getting out of her car and going to her front door. He knocked on and he asked to use Angie's phone and also her bathroom. Now, Donald did admit being in Dallas at the time of the murder, but he denied having anything to do with the actual killing. The officer questioning him noticed a distinct change in Donald's demeanor when she told him that they were investigating Angie's murder. Now, once Donald was arrested for this crime, more women came forward to talk about incidents that had happened to them. An ex-wife of Donald's spoke about how during the marriage, she had been through a horrific amount of abuse and he was actually also violent towards their child. And a number of other women came forward to report having been raped by him. Their testimony was eventually used in the trial. And in June 2008, Donald, now 60 years old, was found guilty of Angela's rape and murder and he was sentenced to death. Donald, however, had a heart attack in 2002 and he died in prison aged 74. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Red Rum. A bit of a different ending today, guys. I am looking for my next case and this time I'm not actually looking for my next Red Rum case. I'm looking for something a little bit different. I've had a couple of people over the years contact me and ask me to look at a case where they have a personal connection to the victim. I'm really interested in doing a more long form podcast or video series, five or six episodes long, and this would be alongside Red Rum. So nothing will change in terms of Red Rum. There'll still be your weekly episode in exactly the same format, but I'm quite interested in looking into another single case that's maybe more well suited to be told over the course of a few episodes. The main thing I'm looking for is that it hasn't been hugely covered and that you have a personal connection to it if you're going to suggest it so I can talk to you about it basically. If you have a case that fits that please do drop me a message. As always I will leave the Instagram, Facebook, Twitter 
um, and my email in the show notes below. My email address is redrum true crime podcast at gmail.com but I'll put it in the show notes in case you need to come back to it later. I do have a couple of cases that might fit that format already so I'll keep an eye out um, for, for any more and I'll compile a list and of course I'll let you know if I do start down that track and I'd really appreciate your support and also just let me know if that's the kind of thing you would like to see. Oh and thank you if you recommended last week a uh, horror film, a British horror movie um, especially. I uh, I got some great suggestions. 28 Days Later came up a couple of times. I've seen that before and I just think it's brilliant. It's got Killian, Cillian? Killian Murphy in it, who obviously is phenomenal. Um, and uh, he is in the new Quiet Place too, which I really enjoyed, but I really like the uh, other actors in it too. Oh, actors, actors, actors. Always chatting about actors. Um, what else? Oh, I watched Shawshank Redemption the other day, which obviously is like super well known, but, um, Stephen King. Oh, Stephen King. What a genius. I love pretty much all of his work. I had Misery suggested so many times when I was asking for horror films. That's my next one to watch. I've heard so many good things about that. Um, but Shawshank, if you've not seen it, see it. You must immediately see it. It's so good. Uh, what else can I recommend you? Um, I haven't really been to the cinema. Oh, I'm going to see Trap on Friday, which is the new M. Night Shyamalan film, which should be, well, it should be good. It's actually not got the greatest reviews, but, um, the trailer really has hooked me. So I'm really looking forward to that. I will let you know how that is. Other than that, if you haven't checked out last week's episode, um, the murder of Barbie Bayer, and it wasn't just the murder of Barbie Bayer, it was the murder of at least six individuals, six women, um, probably more, uh, but I didn't want to put the perpetrator's name in the title. I don't like to do that. Mm, I go on about this all the time, but I really try not to highlight the perpetrators of these crimes. I try and highlight the victims, um, which is sometimes a bit harder to do because there's not always the material out there. But if I can name the case after a victim rather than the perpetrator, then I usually try and do that. That's why it is one person's name rather than either six people's names or the perpetrator's name. Um, I'll leave a link to that episode in maybe like at the end. It's probably gonna pop up in a box somewhere here. Uh, other than that, that's it. Ramble, ramble, ramble. It's been a long day. Oh my goodness, it's 11.24. It's the middle of the day, but it's been a long day. Um, I'll see you next week, guys, for another episode of Red Rum. Bye.